My friends, before we begin, I want to make a disclaimer that every source and every information I say in this video, all of the sources are in the description below. So I encourage you to do your own research, check out the sources, make up your own mind. Now we're on Google Maps and the first zoom in, we have these different zoom ins. The first one takes us to Moscow, to the region or the city region of Krasnogorsk where the Russian Minister of Defense claims they shot down two drones last night. Yes, there was another Ukrainian drone attack against Moscow. What am I saying? There was no drone attack. It was just two cases of extremely careless smoking all around the Moscow vicinity. And up until now, three major, the biggest Moscow airports have suspended all flights. So the planes that are up above have been pushed forward to other airports. For example, St. Petersburg, some planes back to Belarus. And the planes that are on the ground are remaining on the ground. Moscovites cannot fly. They cannot go where they want to go. Imagine being a pilot in Moscow lately where these drone attacks are a very regular occurrence. You go to work, you press all of those thousands of buttons in the cockpit, you're ready to go and then another Ukrainian drone attack. Oh well, put on the Russian Doomer music and chill back. On this footage you can see all of the car alarms. Actually, you cannot see them, you can hear them. All of the car alarms that went off after the explosion. All of the people in those apartments, they cannot sleep. They go out trying to silence their cars with a remote, but being up on the 20th floor, because these are high rise, you gotta go down. You go down, you silence it, and there's always this one guy who is not at home. And his car is going till the night, till the morning, until the next drone attack. He will never shut up. Now, my friends, we're gonna watch a video that came out one to two weeks ago. And it's a questionnaire for Moscowites. How they feel about these Ukrainian drone attacks against their home city. And again, I want to say a disclaimer. We cannot take this questionnaire or these answers as the truth or as how the Moscowites think. This is an edited selection of people. But there's a surprise in it and it's very rare, that's why I want to share it. So drones attack Moscow. They do, I know. Every day. Why? What do you mean why? It's because we have been attacking Ukrainians for the last 1.5 years. Look at the face of this guy, he's like, oh my god, he's going to dangerous territory. Not only the guy who is answering might go to jail for this, the guy who is interviewing also might go to jail for this. And I gotta say, the interviewer and the answerer are both putting their lives in danger with this information right here. I mean, they're brave dudes doing this in Moscow. Do we deserve to be attacked? Imagine you're sitting at home and some people come over to dictate their own rules. Yeah, I mean, let's take Americans for example. You guys love your property. You love to come out of your property with your shotgun and say, get out of my property. Well, the same situation here. Somebody comes onto your property. You don't have a shotgun. And they say to you what to do. Well, at least America right now is giving Ukraine the shotgun to defend their property. Don't you have the right to retaliate? Of course you do. I even say it's good that we're starting to get a sense of what's going on now. It is so weird for me. I've been saying this for a long time that, oh, these drone attacks show the Moscovites what this war is about. They're getting to feel the nervousness and the anxiousness of this war. They cannot hide away anymore. And now there's a person from Moscow saying the exact same thing. So it's a bit weird. But again, a disclaimer, this is not how most of the Moscow people think this is a very edited, selected minority. Or else we continue to live in a dome where we know about events only through internet sources. And now we're getting a better sense of what's going on. Do we deserve the drones then? Well, yeah we do. It's bad. We need to fight it. We probably need to stop the war. And how will we stop it? We need to negotiate. They will kick our door out tomorrow for the answer. I mean, this guy is... The guy on the left is answering and the guy on the right is like, oh, dude, dude, stop. Like, you don't want to go to jail. They will kick your door down. You, you can see the hints throughout all of these interviews that the people know that they're on dangerous territory. They know what they're, they're risking with. They know in Moscow that they will be arrested. Yeah, brave guys if they're talking about it. We all need to unite. The Russians should probably grab a bottle of beer and go protest. <laughs> well, no... Good, good initiative. Grab a bottle of beer and go protest. And a very brave sentence to say because even if you're owning a white sheet of paper in Moscow, just like that, you're gonna get arrested. So these guys might get arrested or questioned at least by the 
FSP. Good thing you said probably, otherwise the door would have been kicked out tomorrow. What can be done so they stop attacking Moscow? Turn off TV and start thinking. Ooh! And that's your advice to Russians? Turn off TV and start thinking. And my friends, I don't want to say the same thing, but I just encourage you, if you're watching my videos also, follow the sources in the description, read the articles yourself, and also make up your own mind to have your own opinion. Don't only trust mine. Yesterday I reported a Ukrainian drone attack on a Russian Solnitsa airfield where Russian strategic bomber, nuclear capable bombers were stationed, 222 bombers. On this satellite image now we can see that these bombers are gone. Russia moved them and instead of one of the bombers there is this black spot on the pavement where this bomber was and where it burned to the ground. So this bomber had a huge issue. He really liked smoking, you know, and you shouldn't smoke when you're that old. I mean, these bombers did their first battle flights about 30 years ago, so they're you know, not in the first, they're, you know, living the life, but they shouldn't smoke, I guess. And this bomber really liked smoking, so got careless. One careless cigarette and boom, it was up in flames. My friends, let's zoom into the southern area of Bahmut, where Ukrainians actually liberated new territory over a very long time because usually Ukrainians are holding, holding in defense. The Russia is the attacking side on Glishivka since if you look at the topographical map and you already all know this, look at this heightened ground, Ukrainian artillery positions facing down into Glishivka making it a kill box. This is the 19th of August and we go forward, we see Ukrainians liberated new territories on the northern side of Andrivka pushing very close to the settlement and the Russian situation in the Andrivka settlement is getting more desperate. So Russians, in order to divert Ukrainian attention from this area, struck from Klishivka, the northern part of Klishivka. See this road from the north of Klishivka snaking through to the Ukrainian liberated side? Even further to the north, there's another road right here, controlled by the Raskvardia unit Ahmat, which is a Kadyrov's specialized unit sent to Ukraine. Well, there was one of the biggest Russian armored attacks, because they don't commence that big attacks anymore. One of the biggest ones over these fields. Let's look at the photos. Three Russian tanks and three Russian BMPs, so that is six armored vehicles all together from north of Klishivka, from this road right here, cut into these fields. There is small road going like that. You don't see it here. And this was their axis of attack. And we have on the next photos, we can see that this is the very same road these six armored vehicles took. And it's on the gray zone, it's no man's land. And these fields are heavily mined, so this is why the Russians followed the road, and this is why we already see a small photo here. You, you notice the distances, there are none. What, this is three meters, this is five meters. Distances should be longer. But since they wanted to get over the no man's land very quickly because Ukrainian artillery has shot in positions, meaning they know exactly where the artillery will land. Secondly, the fields are mined. Russians wanted to get through extremely fast, so they were bumper to bumper, six armored vehicles. And what happened? This photo just before the destruction began. One, two, three, four five and six and you can notice this is the biggest distance and it's about what 10 meters so immediately bumper to bumper going this way trying to pass the no man's land as fast as possible to avoid ukrainian artillery and mines of course your mines are on the fields and on the road also and on the next photo we can immediately see what happens see this ground all over the place we call it moon surface because it's field but the artillery was shot so heavily that it turned into like these moon craters it's all moon surface and we see one two burning and three and four lost their tracks in mobile and also destroyed. Four armored vehicles destroyed. I don't know where the rest two went. Perhaps they pulled back. Perhaps we don't see them on this photo. But this attack was annihilated. And I cannot say this time that, oh, Russians used a very stupid tactic. They were bumper to bumper. I cannot say it because in this war, sometimes you need to pass certain areas extremely fast. No man's land, which is mined, and artillery positions, which are shot into the no man's land. You need to pass that kill box as fast as possible. So I cannot say anything about their tactics. What I can only say is that Ukrainian defenses were really good. Unfortunately, the Russians are the defending side on the southern front and they have these minefields and shot in artillery there. So to balance out this news, we'll go to the next news. And my friends, I'm sorry, but 
you're not gonna like it. To give you some context about the next bit of news, let's talk about the Ukrainian 82nd Brigade. It is talked about as the most well-equipped Ukrainian brigade period. It was fully equipped with Western vehicles. Up until one and a half weeks ago, it was not initiated into battle. It was part of reserves and they were just beefing it up. The brigade consisted of 2,000 soldiers. Now I know most of you in the West say, oh, NATO brigades, they're supposed to have four to 6,000 soldiers. Well, Ukrainian brigades and brigades in general in NATO also, they're not set in stone always. Some brigades have more, some brigades have less soldiers. That's how it is. Even the armored vehicles and vehicles numbers in general vary greatly in different brigades. So this one had 2,000 soldiers. And we're talking about approximately 150 units of heavy Western equipment armored equipment. It's the best heaviest armored brigade Ukraine has. Now about one and a half weeks ago, this 82nd brigade was initiated into battle near Robotina. I'll zoom into the southern front, but I know, I think everybody already knows this area. Robotina, this area right here, where the Russians hold only the southern urbanized part of the settlement and the Russian reports coming from the settlement are indicating that the situation is very difficult and they might have to pull a goodwill gesture meaning they might have to pull out. A week and a half ago, this footage was released of United Kingdom supplied Challenger tank near Robotina. Now, nobody knew where the 82nd Brigade was in reserves or where they were sent to, but Challengers were only given to the 82nd Brigade. So this gave us an idea that the 82nd Brigade is now sent to Robotina. They're not in reserves anymore meaning the best equipped Ukrainian brigade has been sent into battle. I will read you the next bit of information because it has a lot of numbers, but I think they are important. Leaked Pentagon documents from February and March of this year said that the unit was expected to have 90 United States striker combat vehicles, 40 German-made martyr infantry fighting vehicles, 24 US-made M113s, infantry carriers, and 14 Challenger tanks from the United Kingdom. So we can see British, German and the United States armor in that brigade, all of it Western and the oldest ones here are the 113s. A very, very decent number, especially the 90 strikers. And a few days ago, this photo surfaced of United Kingdom supplied Challenger tank near Robotina under 82nd Brigade with, I hate to say it, a cope cage. This name is the iron cage on top of the tank to protect against kamikaze drones. And when Russians were using them uh, a year ago, we all made fun that uh, these cages, cop cages, they will be destroyed. Well, since these tanks are very valuable, Ukraine also uses these cages and they're mostly made to protect against Russian kamikaze drones, which, I mean, we're talking about Lancet drones right here. Lancet is a terrifyingly effective weapon. Ukrainian forces, some of them have the capability to bring them down with electronic warfare systems. Some of them have the capability to jam the communications of Lancet and the Russian operator. But mostly these drones hit, unfortunately, accurately. So this cage on top of the Challenger, I mean, it's a cope cage. And I hate to say it, but it's necessary. Now, very recently, this footage appeared of an 82nd Brigade troops on a German-supplied martyr driving towards Robotina. And very recently, we have had reports of this brigade being deployed into action in Robotina and in the surrounding areas. And unfortunately, when you attack in any war, in any battle, you will have losses. This is why I hate to report this, but here is a footage of a burning striker, and it's not the only one. Unfortunately, the 82nd Brigade is carrying losses of Western armor near and in Robotina, they are taking ground and Russians are very slowly being pushed out of Robotina. This element will be liberated in the next week. Everything points to that direction right now, but I cannot ignore these losses because that would be very one-sided. So yeah, it is a burning striker. Now the doors are open and the striker is a very capable vehicle to defend the troops inside. So I'm guessing it did the job it was meant for, to keep the troops alive and take the hit which it did. All right, my friends, I have reported some Ukrainian losses, so now we'll go to the Russian losses of the past 22 hours. 22nd of August, 2023, we have 410 Russian liquidated personnel. We have four tanks, uh, two of which we saw from that footage destroyed near Klishivka. 27 armored personnel vehicles, again, two of which BMPs we saw from near Klishivka eliminated. 
on the minefields. 31 artillery systems, definitely above the 7 day average. 2 anti aircraft warfare systems, 3 UAVs, 30 vehicles and fuel tanks, and 3 special equipment. High losses. Well, the manpower losses are below the 7 day average, but still above the Russian limit of resupplying the army with biomass so they indicate towards a new mobilization in the coming months. My friends in this video Zelensky summarizes his meetings with the Dutch, Danish and Swedish prime ministers and the deals they made. Most of the talk is about the F-16s but there is one interesting information which is that Ukraine and Sweden now have a deal, uh, agreement, cooperation that Ukraine will be start producing infantry fighting vehicles CV-90s in Ukraine. Estonia also deploys CV-90s in our military and in the past videos where I mentioned that they are very capable infantry fighting vehicles people have commented that oh they're crap, they're garbage, they're old. It is not that much about the vehicle which is metal like in any vehicle, it is about the sensors, the weaponry on top of it. Estonia has a very modernized version of CV-90s with the modernized sensors, weaponry and the capability very high. Now the CV-90s giving to Ukraine have a little bit older weaponry than Estonia has, older sensors. We're talking about night vision cameras, infrared cameras, laser sight finders. But this made me think Zelensky is uh, putting a lot of energy into getting these deals of weapons and infantry fighting vehicles and ammunition being produced in Ukraine. This made one comparison inside my head. Israel got its statehood in the aftermath of the Second World War. And immediately they were plunged into war with the Arab coalition. Many wars actually. Three major war against the Arab coalition. And they were a new nation with almost nothing. And they were able to push the Arab coalition back. Surrounded by their enemies. They were able to start their own weapons manufacturing program. They had powerful allies of course. But strong resilient people that were able to push back the enemies. And now they're an established nation in the area. They're producing their own weapons and exporting them. Now Ukraine reminds me of that. It's a thriving nation that now is getting these weapons contracts, starting to produce their own weapons. They're surrounded by Belarus and Russia on two sides, but I feel like they're moving on the same path. So producing these infantry fighting vehicles, CV-90s in Ukraine is a very big step towards that, towards the Israel model. Also, I read that Ukraine already has started the production of the NATO standard caliber 155mm artillery rounds. There is also incredible drone production going on in the country. And there is maritime drones, these sea drones already. So Ukraine in the next 10 to 15 years might become a weapons exporter. Because they are going to produce so many. And they have powerful enemies also powerful allies. The other country who is doing this is Poland. One of the main Polish goal with buying weapons, which they're doing a lot right now, so many weapons, they're buying everything, is that they will be produced in Poland. The Korean K2 tanks will be produced in Poland. They also bought Abrams and they bought Apaches. Now, I am not sure these will be produced in Poland, but they definitely will be repaired in Poland. Poland also has their own very strong weapons production and they too, I think, in the next 20 years will be a major weapons exporter in the area, rivaling that of Germany. There has been a lot of talks about the Russian assault near Kupiansk, this Ukrainian settlement right here. It's called the Kupiansk Offensive or Kupiansk Counterattack. Russians are heavily pushing in this area, you can also see the arrows. But now they have hit a little bit of a, a dead end because Ukrainians have deployed their reserves into the area and stabilized the onslaught. Now let's zoom into the settlement of, of Sinkivka. This is the next Russian goal. And as you can see, on the northern side there is this massive areas of forest which are easier to defend. Fighting in the forest gives you a lot of cover. Using armor in the forest is much more difficult. Other option for the Russians is east side of Sinkyevka, which are plain fields, as you can see. The Russian occupied side only fields, the Ukrainian liberated side fields, very minor windbreaks, forest belts right here. So this is all mined, the no man's land, heavily mined. Russians face two options. To go from the west of Sinkyevka in the forest, facing very strong Ukrainian defensive positions or to go to the east of Sinkivka over these mined fields without any kind of cover being under Ukrainian artillery fire. So the options are not very good. Future days will show which option the Russian will choose. Both options will mean heavy losses and Ukrainians have a strong defensive capability by now in the area. My friends, 
as we do in every video, I also want to guide your attention to these patrons who have supported the channel. These guys lift me up, they're like a security net, and I want to show my gratitude in the weirdest way possible by butchering some new patron names. Let's go. Jeffrey Dehan, Elemental, Your Mental, Alex Soki, Ian G, Donald Demers. Thank you to these five people for helping me out. If you like my videos, Patreon link is in the description below. Or if you don't want to do a regular donation, also PayPal is in the description below. My friends, also I encourage you to go to Instagram and check out what I do in my life. Some surprise projects are coming up very soon and only for Instagrammers. I'll see you there. Until next time, my friends, stay cool.